Hey everyone, it's Dr. Howard. We're beginning our discussion now on behavior deceleration techniques, specifically positive punishment. Now, if you've gotten to this point and you have not yet watched the two earlier videos about misconceptions and behavior analysis, uh, misunderstandings about what the terms positive and negative mean, and the video on form versus function, you should really check those out before starting these three videos on positive punishment. This first video is just going to focus on the history of mental health treatment and what I'm focusing on here are some of the historical and unfortunately kind of inhumane ways in which we have in the past tried to decelerate or stop behavior that our culture considers dangerous, disruptive, or disgusting. So those are the three Ds that we really talk about when we uh, consider what behavior is acceptable and unacceptable. If it's dangerous to the client or people around the client, if it's disruptive to the environment around the client, for instance, an agency where, where the client may live, or the culture, the, the neighborhood in which they, they live their everyday life, and disgusting, things that we would consider completely inappropriate in terms of hygienic standards or even interpersonal standards. Those are the places that we tend to focus. And unfortunately, in our history, we've used some procedures that would be considered probably inhumane by today's standards. I want to take you through briefly what those standards have been and this long-term view of where we are now when we talk about how we choose programs, how we intervene and change behavior. So let me switch here so I can give you some information on screen. So when we talk about the history of mental health treatment, it really helps to go all the way back to our earliest kind of pre-recorded history. And we know from looking at archaeological findings that uh, some early tribes, some prehistorical groups tended to view uh, abnormal behavior, behavior that's dangerous or unusual, as caused by supernatural influences. These could range from everything like demonic possession to intervening uh, by a deity or a god. And in favorable ways, this could be viewed as an actual intervention by, by, your, by your god. For instance, we, we have early shamans. Uh, but in some ways, if the behavior is uh, disruptive, dangerous, disgusting, if it doesn't fit within what's accepted and it's not helpful to the group, then it would probably be seen as the intervention of uh, an agent bent on destruction. And so in, in early, early, early treatment, the focus there would be on somehow exercising that spirit out through whatever methods possible. Maybe this is what we uh, traditionally think of as exorcism. Maybe there's a, a a rite or some sort of religious proceeding that takes place where you try to remove that supernatural influence from the organism, or uh, sometimes there were more physical or direct interventions. In this case, one that we know of that was used common, uh, commonly in these groups is called trepanning. And this would be when a hole was either cut or drilled into the skull to allow spirits out of the body with the belief that that would release the spirit and the behavior would go away. Now, of course, you know, Stone Age brains, we aren't always the best at reasoning and decision making. It would make sense that you put the hole in, people act a little bit better after the, the hole's gone into the, the organism, but was that due to a spirit being let out or is there another confounding variable such as, well, now you have an organism who's experienced significant pain and trauma, is this the side effect of shock? And there's no evidence to suggest that trepanning actually um, manages or treats behavior. So this is a very, very early example of one of the ways in which we tried to intervene to, to change or to ameliorate some of the symptoms associated with um, mental illness or, or that we really try to change a client's behavior. Now, moving forward a little bit, you see that in recorded history and in, in antiquity, uh, some would argue that mental illness and personality come from these balancing of different chemicals or different uh, what were called humors in the body. Now this is the foundation of most early medicine, this idea that the body of course tries to maintain homeostasis. We're familiar with this from general psychology, from biology, and, and this is widely accepted that the body should function a particular way, and when there's an imbalance in some way, then that can really mess up the system. So in ancient treatment, what we're talking about are methods that 
are meant to bring these four humors back into alignment. So the easiest explanation would be, for instance, if you have a sanguine temperament, uh, you have a personality that's very gregarious, very outgoing, very fun-loving, and if it's too much, right, for instance, if you're experiencing symptoms that we might call uh, mania, where you're not thinking clearly, you're not rationalizing, um, you're, you're a little bit out of control, then a person may recommend that you bring yourself back into homeostasis or back into alignment, you balance your humors by getting rid of some of that excess blood that you have. These would be things like bloodletting or using leeches. So this is ancient times, but you see that this form of homeostasis or balancing treatment actually continues well into uh, 17, 1800s, and we see echoes of that when we talk about the ways in which uh, uh, psychoactive medications are used to balance neurotransmitters. We have the same philosophy there where one of the neurotransmitters may be out of alignment, so what we're going to do is supplement uh, those neurotransmitters either by adding more or by adding an agonist that's going to mimic the effects of the actual neurotransmitter, or we're going to use an antagonist to block the neurotransmitter to make sure it doesn't come through. In modern treatment, that has some pretty good effectiveness. There's not as much support here, again, to suggest that balancing these, these bios, the blood, the phlegm, uh, black bile, yellow bile, that that's going to be effective at changing behavior and managing any kind of mental illness. When we come forward a little bit into uh, periods of time that we might call uh, medieval times that we might call the dark ages it's kind of an un, uncharitable moniker that we give to those times you see that between the 12 and and 1500s uh, what we're doing to try to manage behavior is a lot of aggressive physical corporal control and body modification so when we move into this period you see that behavior is it doesn't matter what the behavior is so long as you are not a disruption to the group to the culture to your neighborhood to your society uh, that's what we're working on. We see things like beatings and burnings where you would try to, for instance, get the spirit out of you through uh, actual branding. You see that um, there would be similar to how we might work in animal husbandry, uh, some castration or removing parts of the body. Uh, for instance, if you geld an individual, if you remove uh, part of their reproductive organs, just like we do with dogs and cats or, or domestic animals, then that may calm the individual. There was also a belief, uh, a belief in animism, this idea that, that different creatures had different properties. So for instance, if you, if you want to have a, a greater constitution, if you want to be healthier, then it, it might help to get a transfusion of ox blood because ox are known as, as being very hardy animals and they can stand up to a lot of um, a lot of experiences in that way. So getting that transfusion is going to give you the spirit or the essence of the animal and it's going to help change the way that you behave. So if you want to improve your health or if you want to be calmer, maybe you need to get a, an injection of owl blood to, to increase your wisdom and your calm uh, calmness. So these these were widely used. And of course, one that we are much more familiar with, lobotomy uh, was used intermittently and it became really really very popular in uh, the 1900s right so 19 uh, I believe in the 50s it became phenomenally popular as a form of treatment so much so that that people were actually um, given correspondence courses on how to learn how to lobotomize people and then could just sort of drive from town to town uh, offering this as a medical service and we see that this started actually in um, the Middle Ages or, or what we might call uh, medieval times prior to the Renaissance. Moving into the Renaissance, uh, again, the, the focus really was on how do we make sure that folks who experience uh, the, this kind of disruptive behavior, how do we make sure that we're protecting the populace from the client? How do we, we keep society safe, uh, but often at the expense of the person who's experiencing those symptoms? And what you would find, uh, especially in, in European countries like France, is that people who experienced madness, right, or people who were considered lunatics, again, this was back when we believed that it was tied to, tied to the moon and the phases of the moon, people who experienced madness would be 
put into prison. The idea there being we just need to protect society from the person who experiences the mental illness. So unfortunately what that means is you have a person who who may not be in their right mind. You have a person who may be uh, needs that support, needs additional care, and now they're actually in a general population with hardened criminals. They're in with people who have their full faculties, but who've engaged in violent behavior, violent crime. And so many people saw that during this period of time when folks were simply being incarcerated for their mental illness, that the, the people who would be victimized in this arrangement were actually the, the person experiencing the mental illness. So because of this, uh, we see that there was a, a huge movement towards the use of um, of asylums. We have a, a, a modern perspective of what an asylum means, but at the time, consider that, that these asylums were something very, very different, right? We had people coming in and taking people out of prison or taking people out of living in barns when their families couldn't manage them or couldn't have them in the house, taking people off the streets. And we, we now begin to recognize that a mental illness may be uh, a, a medical issue. Now, this was around the time that we started noticing the relationship between um, syphilis, the sexually transmitted disease, and neurosyphilis, one of the long-term side effects or one of the long-term effects of having syphilis, okay? Neurosyphilis is uh, where your brain matter actually starts to break down a little bit and you a, a person who might otherwise be normal then develops these symptoms of madness because of the way that their brain reacts to their to their illness so now that we see that this is affecting otherwise normal members of society now we, we start to believe that well maybe something else is going on here maybe it's not um, that, that they're mad. Philippe Pinel uh, really helped advocate this idea that madness or mental illness is a medical condition. This requires treatment. It's not simply enough to throw people in jail or, or keep them in the attic where no one knows that cousin Steve is, is really messed up. We want to take people, we want to separate them out from a prison population, separate them out from, from a any kind of victimization they might receive. And we want to focus on finding what's actually causing the disorder. Now, even within the asylum system, we're still going back to forms of treatment that would focus on things like homeostasis. You might have ice baths to uh, reduce the, the, the heat or the temperature of the mind. If, if the brain is overheating due to um, the madness, then we're going to balance that through uh, the use of ice baths, or, or we, might, um, we might still use uh, some forms of physical pain in order to manage uh, that that condition. But in this case, what's happening is folks are, are taking clients and moving them into these special facilities, these special hospitals. And these hospitals really were at the start, these very therapeutic environments. So what you see on the right uh, are all of the staff who are working at this hospital especially when you see them in France, in England, uh, in Germany, these asylums are uh, created and opened in these kinds of idyllic settings. These are, are much more like what we might think of as spas um, or uh, a kind of country-based hospital setting than they are for what we in our modern society think of as asylums, as these kind of scary places where people go. Um, it, contemporary writers at the time speak to the value of these asylums because we're really talking about a, a complete and dramatic change in your lifestyle where in your everyday life you may be uh, running around and stressed and you're in the city and everything's dirty and there's pollution everywhere. Asylum offers special protection. It, it's a very simple life. You can go there, you can get better, you're protected. If you really are just completely messed up, if you are mad, then you can be the mad, as mad as you prefer, right? Because now you're in this place, you're protected, you're cared for, it's structured, and you can do that in a way that's not gonna harm society. Some believed even that by uh, being in these settings, by just going through the process of being mad, that some people would emerge from the depths of madness. They could work through it and, and through that process become saner 
more stable functioning members of society. Now, of course, this is some, but not all asylums. And we, we discovered that Dorothea Dix is a famous researcher. Uh, she was a uh, journalist who worked to get herself admitted to an asylum and ran one of the earliest exposés on these asylum-based treatment centers and discovered that uh, what would happen in the treatment center was not always idyllic. It was not always safe. Uh, in this case, Dorothea was physically abused, physically harmed by staff members working there. And we discovered through this that while this was sort of the spirit of the asylum, that in practice, many asylums were were still places where, where people would experience significant abuse. And there were calls, there were, you know, polls for reformation at that time really focused on how can we make sure that these are treatment facilities where people are being cared for, that they're give, getting the care that they need and they deserve? We had um, made some changes through through time, and, and we were seeing that there was improvement. And in America, we had a number of state schools where folks who experience a variety of, of illnesses could go. You have places like... Um, state hospitals for the mentally ill, state schools for a condition at the time that would have been called mental retardation. We would refer to that now as an intellectual or developmental disability. And again, these were being sold in very much the same way, even though it's about 80 years later, these were being sold as very similar kinds of institutions. These are places where people can go and be safe and they get structured care and support. And we didn't always do our due diligence as a society, making sure that people were being cared for in the way that we thought that they were. So for instance, uh, in the 70s, Geraldo got his big break by exposing this New York State hospital called Willowbrook. And uh, he broke this news of patient abuses at Willowbrook. And, and by abuses, we're really talking about the type of behavior that's caused by just significant systemic neglect and a complete client overpopulation respect, with respect to the number of staff that were available. But it was part of a larger um, culture at the time where doctors were recommending that, that families actually place their children, place their loved ones in these hospitals to make sure that they could get the best care possible but it wasn't always provided. Now that material is incredibly graphic, but I would encourage you to follow the link in the description below, watch that video, because I think it really helps highlight what can happen when we have these aspirational goals and the dangers of what happens when we don't have the resources to provide and make sure that the quality of care is as it should be. So, as a result of exposing what's happening at Willowbrook, as a result of the things that Geraldo Rivera is reporting at the time, there was a, a national backlash and people were shocked. People were just completely amazed at the quality of treatment that children were receiving. These are children who are supposed to be in special schools where they can learn and become better people and they weren't getting it. So there was a national movement toward deinstitutionalization. And you can drive around the country even today and see that there are these huge empty buildings where people used to live and don't anymore because in some states, for instance, like Alaska, as a result of places like Willowbrook or places like institutions where foster children would be housed for large periods of time. Some states have completely outlawed large state schools and large state treatment facilities, but many others uh, adopted or moved toward treatment models within their uh, mental health departments that would idealize something that we call community-based treatment. So community-based treatment is where the person either stays within their own home or they stay in a home-like environment so that they can experience treatment in a naturalistic setting. This could be, for instance, uh, a child who experiences an intellectual or developmental disability staying at home with mom and dad, but then a caregiver comes in to help coach and support mom and dad. 
This could be uh, a person who experiences profound intellectual disability. Maybe they can't stay with mom and dad anymore, so they live in a group home with other folks who experience intellectual disability. And then as a group, they stay in the community, they learn skills, uh, and they learn those in the natural environment so they can be supported by the natural environment. That's really the key there. There's a higher visibility of people who are different. And when you're in your own natural environment, you can harness um, not only the folks who are paid to be there with you, your staff, but you can take your client out into the community and they can make friends, they can meet people, they can meet people in their environment. They they find what they love, They they are, people. So the services that are really meant, the spirit of services in community-based treatment are empowered services, ways of keeping the individual who experiences the mental illness, the intellectual disability, what have you, a connected member, a connected part of their community. And you often see this very high overlap between community-based treatment and person-centered planning. The beauty of person-centered planning is that we're talking about a treatment modality where the client themselves are an active part of their own treatment. So it isn't necessarily that, look at this behavior change program, it works for kids with autism, so I'm gonna give it to every child with autism. Nah, no. What it does is it recognizes that everyone is different, right? That what works for you may not work for me and vice versa. And in person-centered planning, what we're talking about is considering the whole person, right? Not just a problem behavior, but what is it about that person? What are their wants, their needs, their desires, their drives, their hopes, their dreams? What is it that we can do to help support them to recognize their desires and their interests, to capitalize on those, and help make sure that they're reaching their longer term goals. So we really want to be thinking about the future of the person. We want to make sure that, for instance, Rebecca here isn't just learning the skills necessary to make her calm and docile in her group home, but rather that her group home is supporting her so that she can learn the skills necessary to grow up, to get her own apartment, to live independently, to have a job, to meet someone she cares about, to have a family, to have whatever it is that Rebecca wants in life, right? That's the beauty of person-centered planning. And when we talk about behavior analysis, what I want you to realize is that at its spirit, at its core, behavior analysis is person-centered planning. So when you consider form versus function, we're not just interested in figuring out how do we reduce your problem behavior? We want to figure out how do we teach you the skills necessary to live your whole life in the best way possible. All of the principles that we've described are universal. So reinforcement, shaping, punishment, these are universal principles, but that doesn't mean that the way that I use reinforcement is going to be the same for you as it is for me, right? Your reinforcer is not my reinforcer. A punisher for you, if I even want to use one, which usually I don't, a punisher for you may not be a punisher for me and vice versa. So it's not enough that we're just adopting the same treatment modality for everyone. We really want to carefully consider the person, the function of their behavior, and to develop a treatment program around that individual that's going to help them support and live their best life. Now, remember, all of our clients are unique, so this is not a one-size-fits-all approach to treatment. What we're talking about is we're going to find something that works for each individual, and we're going to carefully analyze, is this working, is this not? We know that what works for one client won't work for another client, except that we may use those same universal principles. We may capitalize on the fact that organisms will do things that pay off again and again. We may use the principle of reinforcement, but the actual procedure that we develop, that we refine, is going to be different for each of our clients. Because each client needs that unique plan to meet their own individual needs and their own individual goals. So, I hope that this better helps explain why when we talk about moving forward, why you want to start in one place and not immediately jump right to punishment, that this makes sense. So if you have any questions about the content, please feel free to leave a, a comment in the description below. Uh, I know that this is a gross oversimplification of the history of mental health treatment, but I really want you to have that context for why we want to focus on uh, person-centered planning, why we want to focus on reinforcement first as a behavior change procedure, and do be sure to check out the next video where we actually talk about punishment as an intervention and talk about some of the strengths and limitations of that intervention. I'll see you guys next time.